Hi there, I'm Rosemary Barton. Here's what's at issue this week. Three years after 22 people were killed across Nova Scotia, an inquiry into the mass shooting has condemned the RCMP's response. Among our recommendations, we are calling for major changes to RCMP oversight, processes and culture. The RCMP was criticized for its lack of preparation and lack of communication. The commission called for a major overhaul of the force. The RCMP apologized to the people of Nova Scotia, but had not read the report and could not respond in detail to the recommendations. The RCMP is fully committed to rebuilding the trust and confidence of Nova Scotians. As part of these efforts, we must ensure that the vital work of the commission will last a lasting impact on public safety. Meanwhile, Public Safety Minister Marco Mendicino vowed to hold the RCMP to account. And my job as the Minister of Public Safety is to hold the RCMP and law enforcement to account to ensure that we make the reforms that are necessary. So what's to be made of the Commission's recommendations? What kind of changes should be made or could be made in light of this to the RCMP? Let's bring in at issue Chantelle Bear, Althea Raj, and filling in for Mr. Coyne this week, Aaron Wary. Good to see everybody at, for a third time, some of you this week, so thanks for doing this. Um, Chantelle, I'll start with you. There are 130 recommendations, I believe, and more than half of them are about policing, the RCMP, policing culture. Um, it, it, it also seems to me that we've heard some of these same recommendations before. Um, what did you make of, of what the Commission had to say about the RCMP's response and some of their problems that they identified? What they had to say about the RC response to previous incidents and to this tragedy was that the RCMP had not done much of anything to figure out where it went wrong and what it needed to get right. Um, this reads like an indictment of um, Brenda Lucky's leadership, the commissioner, who resigned, understandably, uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, and you have to think that if she had not, she would be tonight out of a job in any event. Mm -hmm. The opportunity for the government here is to appoint someone uh, with a clear mandate to make fairly uh, systematic changes. And, that, uh, and before that happens, the government has to decide whether it still believes those changes can be done from the inside rather than go for a, a larger overall of the RCMP. One of the recommendations was for the, for the public safety minister to commission an independent review of the RCMP. Uh, is there enough here, um, Althea, that there would be a political will to do that and to actually make some significant changes to the RCMP? If they wanted to do it, the report, the Commission's Inquiry report absolutely gives them the ammunition to do it. But it was notable that Marco Mendicino would not commit to that. In fact, my takeaway, well, first of all, I think we need to remind the viewers that the federal government and the provincial government did not want to do this inquiry. They were dragged into it, frankly, by the families of the victims who forced them after they had announced a, a review mm -hmm that was unsatisfactory, that would likely lead to very few questions answered publicly uh, to have this commission. So thank you to the families of the victims who had to fight to get this. Um, instead of hearing the RCMP and the public safety minister say, you know, thank you to the commissioners for this advice, and we know that this, is vi this advice has been given to us for more than two decades, um, mm -hmm. we will finally act. We did not hear that. Instead, we heard the interim head of the RCMP acknowledge that he had, or the Mounties had received the report yesterday, and he had not taken the time to read the recommendation. Like, what else, Commissioner Zahem, did you have to do yesterday that prevented you from looking at the recommendations for the worst mass murder in Canadian history? I, I find it mind boggling. And that the public safety minister would come out essentially acting as a defender for the RCMP? Like, I am not convinced that changes can be brought with this public safety minister, and frankly, obviously not with this commissioner either. Aaron, what do you make of, of what it says about the state of, of the RCMP? Uh, well, it's it doesn't say much good. Uh, you know, there's a there's an overall kind of overarching finding at one point that says, you know, <laughs> there are major changes that need to happen to RCMP culture about how decisions are made, about admitting fault, admitting mistakes. I mean, that's that's sort of root and branch stuff. And I think it, you know, to Althea's point, 
it, it does put a lot of pressure on the government to get the next RCMP commissioner right, uh, but I think it, it's, it's twofold. One is to make sure that you've got an RCMP commissioner who can make the internal changes. But to Althea's point, it also, uh, you know, would behoove the government, I think, to to find an RCMP commissioner who can represent this this police force uh, and that organization publicly in a way that builds confidence and trust, and that uh, uh, it shows openness and a willingness to engage with serious concerns about how that force is being run. Uh, I think that, you know, as much as there are internal problems clearly with the RCMP, I think it has really suffered. Uh, under this in interim commissioner today and over the previous commissioner with just a lack of a, of a public presence that can speak, you know, straightforwardly to what's going on and, and sort of account for what's going on in that organization. Well, well, to Althea's point, Chantal, one of the things the report says is that the RCMP did a terrible job at communicating in the moment of the tragedy and after. And then to see the interim commissioner today unable to communicate much about the report to me seemed curious. I guess he hadn't read the recommendations, but it's hard to understand if the RCMP is able to learn lessons um, given that. Well, I think it's clear that the, the interim commissioner will not see the word interim taken off his title uh, to, to take on the job permanently. I think the RCMP knew that this report was going to be devastating. Uh, and I also think that uh, like the government initially, it never wanted this commission to report. So whoever takes on that job, uh, is going to, yes, uh, have to learn to communicate, but also we'll have to find allies from the inside. And I think that's going to be the biggest question. It's one thing to appoint someone uh, with a clear mandate to clean house, but that can't happen unless you've got allies inside, people who trust mm -hmm. you. At this point, there is no public trust and no government trust in the RCMP. But it's not clear that the people inside the RCMP will be able to trust anyone who was appointed to make changes. So this is not something that will be resolved overnight or by a ministerial statement in the House of Commons. Because Althea, the, the changes recommend, re recommended are not just about communications, they're not just about how they do their job, they're everything from um, accepting responsibility to, to training at the depot, like everything is on the table when it comes to what has to happen inside the RCMP. And that the Mounties may not end up looking like the police force that we see today. Right. Um, no, they are sweeping recommendations. And when you read this report, and I haven't read all of it, but from what I have read and the recommendations I have gone through and the, the, the facts, just the findings of the fact, are, it is so unbelievable that you could have a police force that seems to fail at every turn, that is unwilling to listen to um, the people that it serves, that it is, that structures are not in place. It, it's so sad to read this and to think that the response that we have received is what we got today. It, it doesn't reflect, you know, we're in this point of crisis. We talk about public trust almost every week on this program. We talk about government secrecy, about secrecy in, in other offices. And here is a chance to rectify the course. And I agree with Chantal, it is going to be immensely difficult. Like, I think we have said that about every RCMP commissioner, <laughs> frankly, at least in the 12 years I've been on this program. But um, I think this is a pathway for change that the commissioners are, are giving the Mounties if they are willing to accept it. And the response today, and I guess this is why I'm so flabbergasted and shocked and still emotional about it, it just did not meet the moment. Chantal and then Erin. Uh, it's... I was listening to us and I was thinking back, did we not have these panels about the armed forces? Uh, and, and all of those things do take time, but I, mm -hmm. I, I'm without here on today's reaction because the message it sends is uh, that if there is a will for change, it is not in the upper echelons of the RCMP, as it was not just six months ago in the upper echelons uh, of the armed forces. Uh, and while some of the things I read today, sending warnings on Twitter in a rural area uh, where the internet is not everywhere and where people don't live on Twitter, they're not like us who are addicted, um, it boggles your mind that, that even the small things were done poorly. Yeah. But 
the report shows that it's not just the small things. It, it starts at the top and it permeates every operation. And that's why the, the commission, up to a point, overstepped its mandate in the sense that they were studying a specific situation, but they have come out with a report that, that covers the entirety of Canada. Aaron. Uh, I would say in addition to the uh, RCMP changes, it's interesting to see the gun control measures that this mm -hmm. uh, report lays out. Uh, if you'd asked me yesterday, I would have said this government had no way forward on gun control after the last attempt ended so badly. I think uh, this report maybe gives them a way to move forward on some further measures on gun control. I would say, though, on the RCMP and on gun control and on everything writ large, you know, we look at the United States and Canada and say, you know, are flabbergasted by the fact that they have shootings and massacres and nothing changes. And I think this is one of those moments where you have to hope that, can that, that Canadian officials, the, the, the federal government and RC the RCMP can actually move forward and make some changes here because that's what seems to be so, la so, so sorely lacking uh, in our American neighbor. Just maybe 20 seconds, Althea and Chantal, on the issue of guns and, and whether there's an opportunity here. Althea. Yep, no, I agree with Aaron. I think it's a really good point. Um, again, I think maybe new leadership would be uh, helpful on that front. Um, but absolutely, it gives the government uh, an in to do actually what I think it wants to do. Chantal, last word. Well, you don't even need to suspect it wants to do it because it reflects the amendments uh, that they had put forward yeah. uh, last fall that they had to withdraw. So uh, uh, on balance, that section of the report was possibly good news for the government, although I'm not convinced that there is a lot of political will at this juncture to re-enter the gun yeah. control free. Welcome back to another round of At Issue. After some NDP wins in the budget this week, we want to take a look at the state of their deal with the Liberals. So New Democrats are very proud that we forced this government to deliver dental care, the biggest expansion of our Medicare in a generation. It's historic and we're proud of that. But there's work that still remains to be done and we'll continue to fight to make sure this government takes the housing crisis seriously. The NDP succeeded in getting the government to expand dental care and extend the GST rebate, something the government now calls the grocery rebate. But what does this tell us about the state of the Liberal NDP confidence uh, and supply deal? What has, has this put any wind in Jagmeet Singh's sales? Let's bring everybody back, Chantel, Althea and Aaron Wary. I'll start with you on this, Althea. Um, how, how vital is it for, for Jagmeet Singh to keep getting these wins? Like, put aside the government wanting to avoid an election, and him maybe too, but in terms of him building political credibility when an election actually does happen. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to answer your question, but I think primarily it is vital for the Liberals to sure. keep bending to Jagmeet Singh's uh, contract, basically, that they agreed to last year. Um, the only reason there is dental care money is because the Liberals don't want to have an election at the moment. Yes, that's right. <laughs> um, so uh, as for Jagmeet Singh, you know, there actually is ample in this budget if he wanted to say, nope, it's not enough. Uh, if he wanted to say, you know, the Liberals have broken their promise on fossil fuel subsidies, he could point to the 500 plus million dollars in there for carbon capture and sequestration. He could point to some of the hydrogen tax credits to say, uh, you know, that's not green enough. We're sending money to big businesses that are already profitable. But instead, Mr. Singh is embracing the conservative tag that this is an NDP budget and is actually even going on a budget tour, like oh. the federal government is, on a budget tour to sell the <laughs> NDP budget to Canadians. So obviously he thinks it's a big win. It will show uh, Canadians that the NDP can get big things done, that a vote for the NDP is not a wasted vote. And we know that that is something that the NDP struggles with, with strategic voters uh, usually at the on the last weekend uh, yeah. before election day during election campaigns. Yeah, I mean, it's very much a page from uh, Jack Layton's book, Aaron. I mean, th this is how Jack Layton sort of built his career into, in, I mean, there were other things obviously, but, but this was a big part of it. Yeah, I mean, this goes a bit deeper and further, right? Obviously, in that it's a confidence and supply agreement, and that's further than Jack Layton was ever willing to go. And it, I think in that sense, puts uh, uh, Mr. Singh in a slightly more awkward position. And I don't know that they've <laughs> quite found the right tone so far as, you know, opposing the government uh, on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday and then voting for them on a Friday. It's, you, you know, they haven't quite figured out how I don't think how to sort of marry those two ideas mm -hmm. or at least to sort of explain how how they approach things. But, you know, it, it's hard to argue with getting a, a dental care plan. You know, I don't know whether this is going to 
pay off for them in the next election. I don't know if, if Jagmeet Singh is going to win 200 seats and become prime minister. I suspect it, it won't happen. Uh, it could, but at the end of the day, you know, they got a dental care plan, and uh, we shouldn't sort of skip too lightly over that. You know, millions of people are going to end up with dental care that they didn't have previously. It's a good thing you're not on Twitter. You would have got a lot of angry NDP tweets. That's why you're not on there. Uh, Chantal, what do you make of the deal right oh, now? Well, I'm on Twitter, and I also don't believe it's going to translate into 200 NDP seats. So I, <laughs> I'm, I'll, I'll walk right there. Uh, I'm buying that misery uh, with, without... I think most new Democrat voters um, are not thinking about 200 seats. No. They're thinking about why their party matters. And the NDP has a history um, of, of having influence. That, that's it's the card that sells to its voters. We that's may right. not win elections, but we're fighting the good fight. Mm -hmm. And if you give us enough votes, we will have influence. That, that's the core message at the end of the day. I'd seen victory laps from opposition parties on budget days before, but I don't think I've ever seen an opposition leader have a victory tour over somebody else's budget, which is kind <laughs> of interesting. But the entire point of the exercise is to, to, to make dental care Jock meets Singh's baby in the same way that Medicare is associated with the NDP. Yeah. To, to have something iconic to show for it, its presence in the House of Commons. Whether that will work, I don't know. Yeah. But it's a different game, and to Altia's point, yes, they could have defeated the government over climate, but then they would have had to go on the campaign trail and explain to their voters why Pierre Poiliev was a better pick than Justin Trudeau on climate. And that, which they've tried in the past, is a really hard sell. Yeah, I mean, I've talked to enough liberals who tell me they don't mind if Jagmeet Singh takes credit for whatever he wants to take credit for, so long as when people come to vote, they, they know who actually did it and who actually made the policy decisions. So I guess that's what they're counting on there as well. Okay, thank you all for that. Appreciate you uh, being with us.